good morning. Please bear with my voice because I uh, have a cold and have completely lost it. So everything was working before Kubernetes, but not me, I guess. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm Vicky. I work at Lyft. I've been running Kubernetes um, for different types of workloads in production for about four years, which I think makes me think uh, I'm kind of an early adopter. Um, and I've heard the sentiment of everything worked before Kubernetes quite a bit over the last four years. Um, I think it's a fair statement, but I'd like to offer a little bit of insight um, into how we as an industry has evolved over time and why I think things are actually better. So to dive into answering this question, I think we have to first ask what was before, what was working? Uh, I think it was a simpler time. <laughs> and I'll go through some examples from my personal experience that I think um, seem to be a fairly common progression. OK, so maybe you have something like this. This is like almost how every company I've worked at sort of evolved. <laughs> um, so you start with a single monolithic app as you prototype a new idea and you sort of prove your idea out. Um, and then hopefully it's like working. So you start hiring engineers um, and you start having teams. And then your app keeps growing. So you break up the app and so that you can have some sort of separation of concerns. And then you just sort of continue growing organically that way until you're like, oh god, what have I done? Um, you start running into limitations on actually many things. Um, you start running into limitations on how do you even run the stack on your laptop anymore? Like, how do I even develop locally? Um, other limitations might be with your cloud provider. You might have trouble loading your cloud provider's web console because you just have too many things. Here's another example um, from maybe machine learning. Um, so maybe you start doing machine learning experiments. You have one researcher running training on their laptop, and everything's fine. <clears throat> and then you start training bigger and bigger models. So now you're like, OK, that doesn't fit on my laptop anymore. So let me train on the beefy box somewhere else, maybe in a colo, maybe on a cloud. Um, and then hopefully things are going well. So you, again, start hiring more and more people onto your team. So now you have a fleet of these beefy boxes. And then you're like, oh, what even is running anymore? I don't know how many people have worked with um, machine learning scientists who have like literally lost their experiment somewhere because they forgot where they were running it. <laughs> so, um, so I think in this model, infrastructure teams are often the bottleneck um, because you have to figure out how to manage and version control this fleet of beefy boxes. And you have to manage how to upgrade them, um, how to do security audits. And you have to also have to make sure that you're actually use, using your resources effectively. And maybe it's because of cost savings or whatnot. Um, and the team that manages this environment might be your same infrastructure team or maybe a different team entirely. So meanwhile, hopefully, your business is booming. So you have all these new requirements. Your team keeps growing. You have all these data scientists and machine learning researchers and more. And meanwhile, you have to move fast um, and also do all these things like multi-region, sprinkle some GPUs into your fleet, um, maybe do multi-cloud. <clears throat> so you have to think about how to empower your engineers to be productive in this environment while like, never going down. Um, you have to be online globally all the time we don't really see maintenance windows anymore. Like, this was the thing when I was little. But like, I, every time I see a maintenance windows now, I'm like, what are they doing? <laughs> so, OK, so where do we go from here? There are all these requirements for your infrastructure team. 
You have to keep up with all these business needs. Um, how do you scale your team without being the bottleneck or the gatekeeper? Um, things were working before. They worked well enough that we got here. How do we keep them working? So we turned to the community, and step by step, we started putting the pieces together. So we are where we are because we turned to open source and started building agreements on what abstractions we wanted. Um, kind of like how we started converging on Linux as the base OS. Uh, we agreed on containers for empowering developers and moving fast, and we agreed on Kubernetes for orchestrating these containers at scale. By leveraging this huge community effort, infrastructure teams can provide flexible building blocks for their end users. And, and it, clearly that resonated with a lot of people because, I mean, we're all here. <laughs> and, um, you know, this is the graph that always gets cited for how the interest in Kubernetes just keeps growing. So, are we, are we happy? Is everything awesome now? <laughs> well, I think people make fun of how much YAML they write. I think partially it's a testament to how straightforward and extensible the Kubernetes API is, and more importantly, how user-centric it is. For non-infrastructure engineers, they can do a lot by just manipulating these YAML files. So we've sort of made a lot of progress to expose this higher-level abstraction and to support all these use cases. Uh, but it's not all awesome yet. <clears throat> it's not rainbows and unicorns yet. So we still have some ways to go. We took on this super ambitious task of empowering our businesses and developers to meet all their needs. And Kubernetes gives us a path to achieving all of that and scale with the complexity. But the complexity didn't really fully go away. We are still supporting all these things. For the infrastructure team, Kubernetes can feel complex because in order to support all this flexibility, our infrastructure teams are taking on new responsibilities. For the end user, while their deployment to production becomes more flexible, they need to relearn aspects of development in this new world. So I want to talk through some of the specific challenges that I've encountered in my experience introducing Kubernetes to engineers and go over what the community is doing to address them and where do we go from here. OK. So one question I always get is, now that we've built and provided this platform where we empower application developers to deploy whatever they want to the cluster, how do we control what's running? How do we prevent one user from taking down our entire cluster? So while there are controls that you can implement uh, today already, if you're an enterprise or maybe you're a bank, um, you might want finer grain controls over what runs in your cluster. So one path forward that the community is investing heavily in is open policy agents. This is an example of how a simple snippet like this can be used to restrict what images can be run by the containers on your cluster. And there have been a number of talks at this conference digging deep into OPA, so we can show the interest from the community in this direction. Another question I hear often is simply, how do I develop? Like Now that we've moved into this world of immutable containers running on the cloud, how am I supposed to develop my application? How do I get to a workflow where I can use my debugger or iterate as fast as I used to just running Python on my laptop. And there are other people who have asked this very same question, and there are a lot of answers out there. 
There isn't a clear one winner, but these are just some examples of open source projects that are tackling this very problem. There's so many awesome options. Um, they all take a slightly approach, or slight, slightly different approach in solving this problem. So your pick might be different depending on the workflow that your organization is used to. Um, I want to give a shout out to the application development track where some of these projects are getting covered. So if you're interested, there are some talks today about that. Um, related to being in an immutable world, this is by far the most common question I get, which is how do I debug? Um, do I have to just keep adding print statements and rebuilding my images and deploying them and then looking at the print statements and then just keep going until I like, figure out what's wrong, which is what I think a lot of people do. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that painful. And the, in particular, I'm very excited about this new feature in 116, which I covered yesterday. Um, it allows users to attach a debug container to a running pod, and you can share its network namespace. You can also share its process namespace. This opens up a whole new world of possibilities for how we think about debugging in this world. So for example, you could have a running pod um, that's maybe crashing, or maybe um, it's already running, but it's not doing what you want. Instead of adding print statements or um, redeploying the pod until you get it right, you could just attach another container with all the debugging tools you need to this running pod and just use other tools that are not in your images. So I think one useful example for this is a lot of times people have maybe misconfigured their credentials or maybe misconfigured their network. Um, you can use this to dig into what the pod is seeing. And overall, if I look at the theme of the common challenges that we just went over, I think that we're, we've evolved to a place where we're iterating on user experience. We started with this huge problem space. Kubernetes provided the foundation for orchestrating containers and the building blocks to power our workloads. Now that the building blocks are in place, we can focus on building higher level, or we can focus on working on higher level problems to simplify and improve the user experience. And I think that, again, everything worked before Kubernetes, but it was unclear that it was going to keep working as well as they, they did, given all the new requirements that are asked of us. Um, and I think that, you know, thanks to the community and everyone here, we're getting there with Kubernetes. Thank you.